All right, uh, good morning and welcome to the second session of our lecture on Introduction to Human Geography. Um, this session is actually a continuation of our previous session. Uh, the difference is that uh, for the previous session, the emphasis was on an introduction. For this session, we're going to look at the approaches to human geography. You know, what are the approaches in which one can adopt to study human geography? Um, the key objectives here are to explain the methods for studying human geography and also to describe the two approaches of studying human geography. There are different approaches in which geography can be studied, but here the emphasis is on two, and that is what we're going to do uh, for today. Um, one would ask why have we decided, you know, to focus on the approaches of human geography. As readers of geography, there's a need to have a tool. And so at the end of it all, this is supposed to give you a skill in which you would use to um, do your long essay um, when you get to the final year or when you have to develop a thesis in your higher studies, let's say an MPhil or PhD in the future. And when I give you an essay, for example, in this course, you know how you're going to approach the specific problem or, or to answer the questions that uh, we will pose to you in this course. So it's very important to study uh, this or have a, a knowledge of this um, uh, approaches to the study of human geography. Yeah, so for this session, the key topics to be covered are the methods for studying human geography, the methods uh, to regional geography, and the key uh, systematics in geography. And then we'll conclude with a summary of uh, the lecture. Yes, and before we go on, I would also encourage you to read chapter one of uh, this textbook, uh, which I talked about um, last week. Uh, on human geography, and you have to read specifically pages 25 to 29. Um, and I will repeat that, that this is uh, a book uh, authored by Fulberg, Murphy, and De Bly. And the title is Human Geography, People, Place, Culture, published by Wide A Plus. Yeah, so what are the methods, or what, are the, uh, what is the method for studying human geography? Yeah, before we go on to the methods of studying human geography, I would want you to take you back to the previous session. And in that session, we talked about the different meanings or what is uh, human geography per se. And uh, we learned that concern itself with everything um, that society does. Uh, it's also about uh, everything uh, society does in relation to space. Uh, it also analyzes the pattern of human activities, and this could be in the natural or um, uh, human or natural settings. Uh, it could also be about the geography, uh, the study of place, space, and the environment. And you remember we had a, a diagram, you know, which interrelates with each other. And then we also learn that geography describes the organization of space, how we put spaces together, you know, construct roads, housing, you know, libraries in, within an area. And then explain the causes of that organization. And in doing that, we look at the factors that leads to the organization of the space, as well as the processes in which it goes through and explain landscape uh, changes and explain the patterns due to man environmental interactions right so this just to take you back and then help you to or tune your mind to what we're going to do that if we if geography is about this uh, these things that you you can see on the slide then there's definitely an approach, a way in which these things can be studied. I hope you understand. 
Um, so when it comes to the methods uh, to study human geography, one can pose this question, how do we study the pattern of man environment uh, interaction? I, I want to find out if you really understand such a question. That is, how do we study the pattern of man environment interaction? Human beings interact with the environment. People are building houses. People would farm an area to get food to eat. And then as a geographer, you are interested in studying these things, try to know why people will interact with the environment. You want to study where this thing is actually taking place, what exactly uh, takes place there. So having had all these thoughts, you think of how do you um, want to come to this understanding, right? So through approaches, concepts, and methods, Geographers uh, develop these ideas to solve these uh, problems. But it's not always about geographers. Non-geographers would also use similar methods because you have to bear in mind that um, geography is a scientific discipline, right? So, and when it comes to the study or si uh, scientific approach to understand a phenomenon, you know, physicists would have certain methods other social scientists like economists, uh, sociologists who also have methods. They are science, so they are kind of related. And there are two key methods. We have the systematic approach and the regional approach. And that is what we're going to focus on as the approaches in studying uh, human geography. Yeah, so um, geographers use all these methods in most cases together to explain um, a geographical phenomenon within a, 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 an area and that may also use one, right? So it depends on the phenomenon or what is at stake, right? So you either use both or you just focus on one. There are certain um, questions or situations which one becomes the obvious. And there are also situations where you have to combine the two. So it depends on what the phenomenon that you are studying. Yeah. So for the systematic approach, it involves analyzing the world or place feature by feature or theme by theme. Right? So you, if, for example, you want to study, um, let's say, population. Now, you look at different features of population. It could be about the population of males, females. It could be about age distribution of a particular population, right? So when you are doing this, then it means you are studying them theme by theme, right? You take the different characteristics of the population and study. So you have different themes or features in which you are studying, yeah. And it involves geographical study of particular type of feature. So how many men, for example, are living in the north of Ghana? How many men are living in the south? How many uh, women are living in the east? So you do all this um, geographical analysis by trying to understand all these uh, activities taking place there. So. Um, some of the examples when uh, we're dealing with the systematic approach, earlier when I mentioned population, we can also look at migration. So when we want to study the migration patterns of an area, we can look at it from a systematic point of view. How many males are leaving a particular area, let's say from uh, rural areas to urban areas? How many children are leaving uh, the rural areas to urban areas? right which age patterns uh, it could also be industrialization you take the urban areas where uh, industries are common you look at the the spread of industries within that area so i mean when it comes to industries you can uh, classify them as um, very large scale industry and as uh, uh, small scale industry so you can look at these as uh, themes in terms of uh, the allocation within a particular area. Uh, it, it could also be the same with regards to agriculture and urbanization. 
right? Uh, it also involves the analysis of the structure, characteristics, distribution, changes of each feature or theme. You know, in the past you could have a very industrialized area, but now because of technologies, you could see that well, some of these industries are no longer big; they are small because a lot of the work that was supposed to be done by human beings are now being uh, taken over by new technologies, right? So one will be compelled to study the dynamics that have taken place, right? So you take all these uh, things as themes and then you, you study them from a more systematic uh, uh, approach, you know, or way, uh, so to say. Now, with the regional approach, it's important for us to understand what a region is, right? And to define a region is any unit of space characterized by a distinctively different combination of many features, right? So how would you divide Ghana into a systematic uh, geography or regional geography, right? So you have to look at it, uh, it as a unit and then tackle it from there. So while the systematic approach involves an analysis of the structure, characteristics, and distribution of changes of each feature or theme, the regional um, approach actually combines the two by way of synthesizing all the features or themes in each region. Right. So um, in the systematic approach, it looks at things from a one-sided perspective, but with the uh, regional approach is more of a combination of uh, different themes or features. So you take all of them and then look at them holistically as compared to one that you tend to separate them. So that's basically the difference between the two. Um, having said that, we need to try to understand the methodologies to the various approaches because they are there, but then you just don't choose them. You need to understand how to go about, you know, when uh, you're dealing with each approach, right? So the question is, what are the methodologies to the systematic and regional approaches to geography, right? So um, in, in doing so, we move to the methods of uh, regional geography. Yeah, so what are the methods of regional geography? Uh, Philbrick listed three main bases of understanding human geography. Um, he says that you need to understand um, human geography from three dimensions, and that is the physical, cultural, and the human uh, dimension. Each category covers uh, a particular set of phenomena, and they also overlap. And all the three represent the whole of uh, geography. So you can see the physical environment here. I mean, so when it comes to studying a, a, a regional, uh, a region as a unit for analysis, then uh, you look at the physical environment, and then you also look at the cultural uh, environment. So here you look at how the ideas, the belief of the area actually influence the place. So talk about the development of the area. You could see that they have developed certain ideas or theories or kind of philosophies that actually shape their thinking. So that would represent the culture. So take like an Islamic uh, community, for instance. You could see that, or any religious community, they have some different kinds of architecture that represent a, a religious symbol, right? So you, you see that that will represent the feature of the area. So compare uh, a place like um, Rome to, let's say, Istanbul, the architecture over there. You realize that there are two different religious beliefs that shifts their thinking that, you know, influence the designs of uh, the urban design of or any special environment in that place. So this borders on culture, right? So you can see it within that dimension. It could also be the human organization, how man 
actually decides to interact with the environment, so to say. So you can see all these three things uh, represented when it comes to the study of a region as a unit. So the fiscal as aspects are concerned with understanding the nature and distribution of material resources on which any human society draws much on the material basis of its existence. So they look at the environment and look at how best they can uh, exploit the environment. Earlier uh, in the previous uh, session, I talked about a situation where in a cold environment, people would decide to kill animals and use the fur, you know, to cover themselves, right? It, it's, it's within this context. If we want to build houses, it means that we have to cut trees. We have to turn certain uh, uh, natural resources into cement, you know, to build our houses. So that comes to play here. And these resources uh, can be taken from food, you know, so we can use, uh, let's say, the natural uh, food like cassava to produce, let's say, cassava chips or flour. Uh, we could also have materials which society build on or manufacture uh, useful articles from. Mm -hmm. The, 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 the uh, shirts that we are wearing are taken from cotton, which is processed, you know. Um, resources from non-animal energy to supplement manpower from production, right? So today we have something like biofuels. Biofuels, we get them from, you know, plants or any agricultural products, you know, which we turn them into fuel for our class. So it's not always about depending on animals, for example, but we can use some of these uh, resources so the importance of any resource depends on the way a society perceives it, and this changes with time and with the state of knowledge uh, of that society. You know, we can see that society has always been dynamic. And then the resources that we've used uh, from time to time has been evolving. Huh? Um, I just talked about biofuels. Now people are using biofuels in their cars. In the past, you know, fossil fuel was very uh, dominant. Now people, uh, as a result of uh, campaigns from environmentalists, people are now using things like synthetic materials. So they are leaving the environment, things that we can take from the environment, and that saves our planet, right? So technologies keep changing. Many years ago, people were using typewriters. Now we've stopped using... Uh, them we are now we've switched to computers and iPads so it means that the inks that people were using in typewriters are no longer useful now right so all these things are actually taking place yeah so the cultural aspect also involves uh, through innovation and dispersion and when we talk about this the uh, dispersion can also mean diffusion and what is innovation um, drawing on, let's say, knowledge from uh, or idea from somebody like Schumpeter, Joseph Aloysius uh, Schumpeter, who was uh, uh, a distinct uh, economist in his time, would define innovations as a new combinations of existing uh, resources. So we would turn existing uh, resources into new ideas. Mm? We used to use the typewriter to process uh, information. Right now, with a computer, we are doing the same thing, but then in a different format. Right, so it's just the existing knowledge which has been turned into a new thing. Right, so uh, with the innovations, uh, we also try to spread the use of uh, these computers that we are using. Started in the advanced countries, but it has been spread to Africa. Today, you and I have access to it. So ideas, concepts, and beliefs and values, that is the motivation on which human society base their decision and actions, right? And the way of doing things is based on tradition or has moved from tradition to technological. Mm -hmm. And innovations, adaptations, and adoption of concepts provide new ways of doing things. 
Mm-hmm. So it means that we've moved from our old ways to, uh, put it this way, uh, modern ways of doing things. And uh, all these things uh, becomes relevant, you know, in studying um, any uh, regional phenomenon. And when it comes to the human organization, it involves the study of human societies, uh, how we are able to organize our place. So you can see in this uh, picture how uh, a city has been designed. So you find all this uh, bridges, houses, you know, um, within that environment. And how this area can be mapped and also studied, right? So you see this place as a, a region. Mm? And you probably want to study the movement of, let's say, vehicles from one area. So you can map this area and see how cars or trains move from one area like this to the other, you know, to study the frequency, the flow of this uh, thing. And you could also decide to study the economics of that area. So what is the market like in that area? What kind of goods? or services to the dealing? What are the social activities there? What are the political activities there? You could look at, say that, oh, OK, in this area, there are a lot of economic activities there. So they are more liberal. They are entrepreneurial. So uh, they would tend to vote for governments that preaches entrepreneurship, right? It could also be that all the structures there are have been uh, put up by the state. So it's uh, more of a planned uh, or welfare society, so they will always vote for a socialist-oriented uh, government. You know, So all these things will take uh, place within the community. And it would, uh, when one has to, wants to study all these things, you look at it from this uh, perspective. So in all, it results uh, in the uh, related area organization in terms of how these um, things actually takes place. Taking on the uh, the third dimension of Philbrick's uh, uh, idea, that's the human organization. It involves a study of human society organ uh, society's organization. So, how do humans organize their society? Yes, and. In trying to understand this thing, uh, an area could be mapped, right? And by mapping this area, you study the kind of activities that actually takes place. So, and in getting the understanding of these things through the mapping, um, there are so many things that actually results in this uh, spatial organization. And it could be the uh, economy, or the economic activities that takes place. It could be about the social uh, activities that actually takes place. You know, you go to certain areas where you have gay communities, right? You have um, places where uh, dominated by the middle class, for example. It could be places where it's dominated by very poor people, like the shanty towns. So uh, it could also be more of political activities, you know, that influence the the organization of the place. So um, when you go to a certain environment, you find out that it's more of a liberalized uh, economy. So uh, individuals are allowed to put up their houses, businesses. So the whole environment is based on uh, what individuals, private people, do. You go to places like the former Soviet Union, which is more of a planned uh, economy or a planned uh, society. Most of the structures that you see have been developed by the state, right? So it gives you the different dimensions, I mean, when you go there. So for example, you go to a place like uh, Ohio, you could see that the spatial organization there is much more different, you know, compared to uh, let's say Tamale, where because of the economic strength, I mean, in Ohio is a very rich city, so the individuals there have money, so they are able to put up different structures. So it gives it a different outlook when you compare it to a place like uh, Tamale. 
Now, um, the next thing is to look at the key systematics uh, in geography. And this also on the uh, methods in studying uh, human geography. Yes. So each systematic approach in geography involves concepts. Huh? It involves techniques and methods. Concepts are usually ideas, you know, which people formulate, right? And then techniques and method are somehow interrelated, right? But they are basically based on approaches in which we can use to study a particular phenomenon. So the question is, which techniques are available in geography when we want to study uh, any phenomenon? Now, in this study, we shall consider three key uh, uh, systematic uh, approaches. That's the economic uh, geographers, for example, will study spatial organization of economic activities. And with that, they can focus on, for example, agriculture, manufacturing, and transportation. So in this sense, they will try to look out for ways, specific themes, you know, in relation to, let's say, agriculture. So what are the specific products or uh, food products are produced in a particular area, right? They would also look at specific manufacturing activities that is taking place. They could decide to look at the flow of a particular form of transport within a particular area. And then when it comes to, for example, social geography, the emphasis will be more on the spatial organization of spatial, uh, social activities. So what is the population patterns of a particular area? What is uh, the health? you know, within an area. Are the people, they're very healthy? You know, maybe as a result of poverty within that area, most of the people don't uh, eat good food, they don't, they, they have a lot of uh, challenges with diseases. So um, for a social geographer, you look at the different uh, patterns of diseases, let's say malaria, it could also be about HIV and now with Ebola. So you study the different patterns, which population within this area have uh, contracted a particular disease and all that. It could also be about political, you know, the politics of the area. It's not necessarily about the voting patterns, but it could also be the kind of ideology uh, so what are the parties, what are the dynamics of all these uh, political ideologies taking place? And then it's also about the physical geography. Um, and here the emphasis will be on studies on spatial organization of the fiscal environment. So when you go to the fiscal environment, you're looking at soils. So when you go up, you know, in your study of geography, you people, you know, specialize in studying soils of a particular area and to see the differences, you know, what influences, let's say, the fertility of that soil or um, the infertility in that uh, particular soil. It could also be about water. You know, they say water is life. So you study the water quality of a certain area, whether it's good for consumption or not, or how this water is used for, let's say, agricultural purposes, its uh, usefulness and the challenges that comes with it. So for such systematic approach, you look at it uh, from some of these uh, three perspectives. But you, you can see that there are different fields or subfields within uh, human geography and the ways in which uh, they would approach it. So um, going further, like the agricultural geographers, for example, they will look at spatial organization from the point of view of agriculture, right? And the key emphasis will be the land use theories and policies. And so what are the land use uh, theories available? So um, um, when you read um, geography further, you meet the likes of von Thunen. Uh, theories, for example, which would help you to understand something of the sort. Uh, the evolution of agricultural systems and the significance of agriculture for human existence. So these are the kind of things that uh, agricultural geographers would concern themselves with. When it comes to manufacturing geography, 
the study of spatial organization comes from the view of manufacturing activities. Mm -hmm. So here, there are so many things. Um, we'll look at the factors, for example, that would influence the location of certain manufacturing industries, for example. How these uh, things are located, um, are widespread in a certain area. So you try to understand why is it so? What factors, you know, influence the concentration of so many uh, industries within a certain area and why is that less in another area? So all these things become relevant. And then for transportation geography, the studies also develop theories of transportation development, right? So it means that there are so many ideas that feed into the understanding of this uh, transportation development. Um, like you go to a place like uh, in a place like Copenhagen uh, in Denmark, they have the finger plan, for example, and it's an idea that has been used. You know, it's something that um, had been borrowed or taken from the central place theory, which when you go up the ladder, I mean, in your readings in geography, you understand that, that it kind of influences how they have modeled their transport system in that country. Um, the network formation and transport and its uh, relation with economic development. You know, every country depends on its uh, economy for its growth. So how these transport networks, you know, would contribute to its economic development? Because if you don't have a good transport network, people are stuck in traffic. They can't go to work, right, or get to work early. So at the end of the day, their productivity is low, and this would affect the development of uh, that country or city or region. So all these things become relevant to uh, transport geographers to study how all these things work together, right? So it becomes a kind of a, a systematic approach in which one can use to uh, understand uh, issues related to transportation. Yeah, for tourism, uh, studies on spatial organization are looked from the point of view of tourism itself or recreation. And what do we mean by tourism? Mm -hmm. Tourism could take the form of a place where people would go and experience a particular activity, like go and see uh, wi the wild animals in, uh, in Kenya or the safari areas. Or it could also be about uh, seeing people doing skydiving, right? So people would just travel from one place to the other, right? And with that, the spatial organization will be based on these things. Um, and in developing all these things, I mean, the key things that one would look at is the what, the where, why, when, and how questions. So what is the agricultural situation in a, a particular place? Where is actually taking place? You know, if you want to study a particular phenomenon, a particular issue on agriculture, so the question will always be on where is this thing taking place? When is this taking place? And how do you um, get to understand this uh, phenomenon that is actually taking place? So these things are very relevant when it comes to the key systematic approach in the study of uh, uh, geography or human geography. Um, issues on population geography we also study the spatial organization of population and here the emphasis will be on census and density so how many people are resident in a particular area for instance and to come to the understanding of this that you can have uh, get this through a census data and also look at the density uh, how many people are living within a particular uh, square kilometer and then for medical geographers, it's more from the point of view of health. So, for example, how many people are suffering from malaria within a particular community? What's the distribution? Are these people uh, all women? Are they all children? Are they all the aged? Right. And then the settlement geographers will also look at the human habitation. 
Mm? Where are these people living? Are they living in Montano's area? Are they living on a plane? Are they living close to the sea, uh, the sea or in a forest area? All right. Uh, with regards to political geographies, they look at the interaction between the political process and the geography of space. So what is the uh, political process in that area? Is it a dictatorial uh, form of governance? Is it a form of democracy? Right? And then when it comes to the spatial dimension, you look at it in terms of a particular place where this thing actually takes place. And then with regards to the historical geography, it looks at the history of places, how they differ from each other. So you can take the history of Ghana and then also compare it with the history of uh, Nigeria or look at it from a different scale, the history of Accra with that of Kumasi. So when you take these two areas, you compare what are the similarities? What are the differences? So take Ghana, for instance. You say, OK, Ghana, the time in which Ghana was colonized by the Europeans is different from that of Nigeria. Ghana became a, a free country and, uh, at a different time as compared to Nigeria. And then the development process, all these things can be studied from a historical point of view. So it's always an issue of time when we talk about, uh, look at things from a historical perspective. So to cite a geographical topic that also involves the what, where, why, when, and how questions, you know, and all these borders on social geography. Now, with the fiscal geography, uh, we can have uh, topics or areas such as geomorphology, climatology, pedology. So with geomorphology, uh, the study will be on the Earth's material. What are the form of uh, materials that we can find? So is it sedimentary or is it uh, volcanic areas, you know, all, all of that. The structure and activities of the Earth crust and landforms. Uh, when it comes to the climatology, it's all about weather and climate. Mm -hmm. Hot and cold. And the uh, pedology or soil geography, the study is on the variation and distribution of soils and factors leading to that. All right. So it, sh it tells you that when it comes to any geographic phenomenon, there are different approaches. You, you just can't stick to one. It's the phenomena or the thing in question that would uh, lead to the kind of uh, approach in which one would use to address them. Um, adding to the fiscal aspect, we have biogeography, which studies plants and the environment. Right? So you would look at a specific plant, for example, and then study how, for example, they grow, the distribution within a particular area. The hydrology will also study water distribution, its management. So how is water distributed in a particular area? So you look at it from, let's say, uh, the distribution of water from rivers to, let's say, the sea. So uh, here in Accra, we have the Kole Lagoon. And water flows from the Kole Lagoon into the Atlantic Ocean, right? So we can study this. And then how it's also managed. Perhaps we could have some technologies which we would use to manage this flow, for example. And in doing all this thing, we also rely on this uh, geographic questions of what, where, why, when, and the how questions. So what is actually the issue? When did it actually take place? How and why are all these things uh, taking effect? Yeah, so having listen to this lecture so far, the questions that we can pose to ourselves is, how would you study population changes in your hometown? So which approach? Are you going to use a systematic approach or are you going to use a regional approach to study the population changes? And the second one is, how would you study the geography of your hometown or region? So you need to think through what you've listened or through this uh, session so far 
and then use that to answer or address these uh, questions. Yeah, so in summary, you've learned in this session the key concepts, uh, methods, and approaches regarding the study of human geography. Um, I hope that you found this uh, session very interesting. I'll see you again in the next session. Thank you.